Welcome to this SY3 screencast where we're going to look at the role of the legal and political entity that we call the state. And as you can see here, uh, the state is the third part of our building blocks introduction to political sociology. So what we're going to do in this particular presentation is define what we mean by the state and then we're going to look at the main institutions that make up the state within Britain. And then in the final part of this screencast, we'll look at how the role of the state in Britain changed during the course of the 20th century, focusing on the transition from the warfare state to what is called the welfare state. So let's begin by having a look at what we mean by the state. So modern states are what we call nation states. And nation states operate within specific geographical boundaries and they each have a central government which exercises control over the population within these boundaries. So modern states are essentially countries with their own uh, central government. And the entire surface of the planet now, with the single exception of Antarctica, is divided for purposes of government into territories that we know as nation states. So nation states are political and legal entities that operate within specific boundaries. So they have borders, they have uh, clearly defined territory, they have a central government which exercises control over the population which reside within these boundaries. And nation states can pass legislation, which means they can pass laws, they can raise taxes from their population. And also, as Max Weber famously argued, the state claims a monopoly on the use of legitimate violence uh, within its boundaries. In other words, the state has an important role to play in maintaining order and security. Now, nation states are, at least in principle, considered to be sovereign bodies. And what this concept of sovereignty refers to is that the state is meant to be free from interference from the outside uh, in relation to its domestic affairs. And if you follow international politics in the news, you often hear about nation states uh, complaining uh, that other countries are interfering in their domestic affairs. And this is treated as a serious matter because they consider that to be a violation of this principle of sovereignty. Now, Max Weber argued that modern states were increasingly based on the principle of legal rational authority. And Weber used the term bureaucracy to describe uh, the legal rational basis of state institutions. So the institutions of most modern states are bureaucratic organisations. And according to Max Weber, bureaucracies have a series of interrelated features. So bureaucracies are governed by uh, written rules and procedures. Uh, their work is conducted on the basis of written documents, all of which are filed and stored. Uh, the work of bureaucratic organisations is divided between different offices, each of which is run uh, according to rules and with clear areas of responsibility. Uh, bureaucracies are hierarchical, so there's a strict uh, hierarchy of officers and officials, uh, a chain of command. And staff are appointed to bureaucratic organisations on meritocratic principles, so on the basis of their suitability for the job, uh, rather than their family connections, who they know, or their personality. Now, whilst Faber recognised that bureaucracy was a very rational form of organisation and even indispensable for the modern state, he also saw it as a threat to individual freedom and a potential problem. So within bureaucratic organisations, Faber saw the strict control of officials restricted to doing very specialised tasks as a limitation of human freedom. So he believed that the uniform and rational procedures of bureaucratic practice largely prevent spontaneity, creativity and individual initiative. 
and the impersonality of official conduct within bureaucratic organisations, according to Weber, tends to produce specialists without spirit. And bureaucratic organisations, therefore, in Weber's view, uh, can sometimes produce an iron cage that imprisons and restricts people. So, so far we've talked about the state in quite an abstract way. What we're now going to do is focus specifically on the main institutions that make up the British state. And there are three main institutions that make up uh, the British state. Firstly, the highest source of political and legal authority uh, within the British state is Parliament. And Parliament's main role is to act as the state legislature. And all this means is that Parliament is responsible for passing legislation or making law. And Parliament also has an important role to play in scrutinising the government. The second important part of the British state is the executive branch, what we normally refer to as the government, which is normally formed by the political party that wins the most seats in a general election. And it's the job of the government to propose new legislation and to implement uh, the laws that get passed by Parliament. And the government is divided up into different departments uh, or ministries uh, that are run on bureaucratic principles. And a lot of those big government departments can be found uh, in Whitehall and the government ministers have a large number of officials, of administrators, who work on their behalf. Uh, and they're referred to as the civil service. And at least in theory, they're meant to be politically neutral. And then thirdly, the other really important part of the British state is the judiciary. So here I'm talking about the uh, court system, the judges, uh, the police... Uh, agencies of social control that are responsible for enforcing legislation and maintaining social order. OK, the last thing that I want to have a look at very briefly in this screencast is how the state developed during the course of the 20th century. And I want to have a look at this transition from what I've called the warfare state to the welfare state. Now, during the early part of the 20th century, the role of the state was expanded significantly due to the demands of war. So the First and Second World Wars were total conflicts demanding unparalleled mobilisation of citizens, economies and societies by the institutions of the state. And these conflicts were also extraordinarily expensive. So as a result, uh, tax revenues as a proportion of national product uh, doubled in most Western societies. However, the onset of peace in 1945 did not initially lead to a corresponding reduction in the role of the state. Instead, the wartime Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, uh, was defeated at the general election and a Labour government was elected that tried to apply the uh, administrative skills of the uh, modern state to domestic requirements, taking responsibility for managing the overall economy uh, and providing welfare uh, for the poor. So Winston Churchill was defeated by this particular individual, Clement Attlee, who was Prime Minister of this post-war Labour government. And under the post-war 1945 Labour government, the warfare state gave way to the welfare state. So the state within Britain uh, began to accept direct responsibility for protecting their citizens, particularly the poor, from the scourges of things like illness, unemployment and old age. So in order to tackle what William Beveridge have famously referred to as five giant evils of poverty or want, disease, ignorance, squalor and idleness, the post-war Labour government set about expanding the role of the state to take responsibility for things like uh, social security benefits for uh, people out of work, uh, a national health service was established, uh, free secondary education was established, 
there was big investment in council houses and there was a policy, a Keynesian economic policy, of maintaining full employment. Now, if you've been following the news at all over the last few years, you'll know that the welfare state is one of the big contentious topics uh, in modern day politics and the current uh, coalition government uh, want to reduce uh, the role of the welfare state uh, within modern Britain. And this is a very contentious topic area uh, which we're discussing class.